Today on the Matt Wall Show, AOC and others on the left have been celebrating the glories of sex work and defending sites like OnlyFans this week. They say it's a legitimate and noble way to make a living. Why are leftists always encouraging people to do things that make them miserable? We'll talk about that. Also, five headlines, including $600 stimulus checks as part of the latest COVID relief bill. What good will $600 do? And today in our daily cancellation, we'll cancel, uh, or rather we will discuss and cancel lots of people associated with the intense controversy over the singer Lizzo drinking a smoothie. Is she betraying the fat community? We'll deal with that question and more today on The Matt Wall Show. You know, something to think about as we head into the new year, maybe sort of a New Year's resolution is uh, that we all should 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 uh, should consider is supporting companies that support us in the culture. Companies, because there's a lot of there are a lot of companies that we don't. We give a lot of money to the, to them, sort of inevitably. But when we find a company that supports our values, we should support them, and uh, that should begin with the pro-life phone company, Charity Mobile. Look, with Charity Mobile, 5% of your monthly plan price goes to the pro-life, pro-family charity of your choice. And that's the that's the charity part of it, and it's great. There's also a lot of great benefits. It's just it's a great service in general. Uh, new activations and eligible accounts get a free cell phone with free activation and free shipping. There's no contracts. There's no termination fees. And there's also no risk. So you can try them out. You get a 30-day guarantee. But you're going to love you're going to love the service. You're going to love also the fact that there's live customer service based in the USA if you ever need help. Um, and uh, look, you can you can block the use of cellular data, picture messages, text messages messages on any. Of, of the lines on your account. You get free usage alerts. You get fr a free app to monitor your usage and pay your bill. Makes it very convenient. And while doing all that and taking advantage of this service, you're also helping to build a culture of life in America by supporting a pro-life phone company. So I would urge you to call 1-877-474-3662 or chat with them online at charitymobile.com. This week, the New York Post has uh, come in for intense criticism after publishing an article about a paramedic in the city who was working a side job selling pornographic images of herself on the website OnlyFans. Uh, the EMT worker, Lauren Quay, apparently didn't want to be profiled by the paper, but they published the story anyway. Now, it's not true that the Post doxed Quay, as they've been accused by other media publications. Doxing is the malicious publication of private information. The story may have been malicious, but they were publishing what the woman herself had already re publicly revealed. You know, anything you put on the internet for public consumption is no longer private by definition. The New York Post did not force Quay or any other woman to make public what should be private. That was her decision. Now, with that said, the story was inappropriate and rather baffling as Quay is not a public figure and nothing about her life is newsworthy. Lots of people put embarrassing material on the internet on purpose a news organization should have a clear and ethical reason for publishing that material. I can't imagine what that reason would be in this case. But the national conversation has gone beyond merely criticizing, rightly, I think, the Post for running a needless and oddly vindictive story about a random woman on OnlyFans. Quickly, the controversy became an opportunity for prominent voices on the left to promote sex work itself as a legitimate pursuit. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez along with the ACLU and others, have declared this week that sex work is work. Lengthy think pieces have been written defending cyber prostitution and old-fashioned prostitution, too, as noble professions. Now, while the wagons are circled around OnlyFans, other publications like The Daily Beast have uh, this week worried that the recent criticism of Pornhub may be driven by anti-sex work bias, which is a very bad thing. It's long been a goal of the left to normalize prostitution. Companies like Pornhub and especially OnlyFans, porn sites that empower women by providing them a platform to sell their bodies, have essentially achieved that long-sought goal of normalizing prostitution, even while prostitution remains technically illegal in most states in the union. But is it true, though? Are women empowered through prostituting themselves online or offline? Is sex work real work, as AOC contends? Now, as to the latter question, in a very strict dictionary sense, the answer is yes. Work means, it's defined as, activity involving mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or result. So I suppose there's a very minimal amount of physical effort involved in posing nude for a webcam. 
And the intended result of helping men masturbate in exchange for profit is no doubt accomplished. But if we take a more elevated view of work and we define it as the use of a certain skill in performing crucial services that have tangible and lasting benefit to the consumer, it is not work at all. There is no skill involved in taking off your clothes and there's no lasting benefit to the other person involved in the transaction. Now, perhaps you could say my definition of work is a bit ad hoc. You know, I came up with it in order to disqualify prostitution. Maybe so, but it points to the clear distinction that obviously exists between a prostitute and, say, a car mechanic. Both are doing something with their bodies in exchange for money. Fine. But only one involves a tangible and rare skill, and the results will benefit the consumer in a substantial way and for longer than a few moments. If these are both work or even real work, they're still not the same kind of work. There's a reason one is respected and the other is not. And it ought to stay that way. The other thing that separates the OnlyFans prostitutes from members of more dignified professions is that the prostitute debases and dehumanizes herself. You know, her entire role is to be debased and dehumanized. She is meant to be nothing but a masturbatory aid, an empty vessel, faceless and nameless. Workers and other kinds of jobs may feel rather debased at times and often for good reason, but the prostitute offers up her debasement as the product. Her body, her privacy, her sexuality, all that is most intimate and sacred is what she sells. It's a very different sort of thing from the Walmart cashier who may experience her own sort of namelessness, but her dignity is not the product that consumers have come to buy. There's a reason that drug abuse and suicide are so common among porn stars and prostitutes. The media chalks it up to mental illness or social ostracization, but one need not be sick or alienated to feel despair amid a life dedicated to one's own degradation. Of course women are depressed when their, quote, work consists of presenting their bodies to be ogled by creepy men on the internet. What else would they feel? Joy? Fulfillment? You know, we're constantly being assured by miserable people that if we do what is meaningless and empty, we're going to find happiness. As always, the lie reveals itself. Nobody actually is happy doing these things that are supposed to make them happy. We find despair and self-destruction where the happiness was supposed to be. That's how it always goes. But it was interesting to debate this issue on Twitter this week and, and read the counter arguments, as I have been doing. Two themes emerge, both seeming at first to contradict the other. You know, first I was told, as we've discussed, that prostitution and porn are empowering and beautiful. But second, I've also been told over and over again that all work is debasing and dehumanizing. Every worker is a prostitute in effect because they're being exploited in exchange for money. Now, this is Marxism and it's wrong, but it helps clarify what's really happening here. See, it, it turns out that the left is not actually elevating prostitution by calling it real work. They are rather de degrading real work. They aren't trying to pull prostitution up to the level of work. What they're doing is pulling work down to the level of prostitution. Yes, prostitution is dehumanizing and exploitative and ultimately pointless, but so is everything else, they say. Their view of life, of everything, is so vulgar and dreary that they cannot see the difference between somebody who uses skills and talents they've cultivated in order to provide a good or service that has actual value and makes people's lives better and someone taking off their clothes and showing their genitals to strangers on the internet. See, it's not actually, it turns out, that they see the genital flasher as doing something noble. It's that they can't understand why the person with the real job is doing something noble. They don't know what noble is or what it means. They see the whole world in shades of gray. And all things to them are empty at their core. So, why not prostitute yourself? Why not turn your body into a commodity? Why not treat it like something no more valuable than a toaster oven you find in the clearance section at Walmart? Nothing has value. Nothing has meaning. That's their fundamental belief. Happily, though, life is much more than they make it out to be. Your body is much more 
than a product that can be put on a shelf. Your sexuality is much more than a service to be bought and sold. And that is the actual truth, which is far more empowering, far more uplifting, far more liberating than anything these people are telling us. Now let's get to our five headlines. I think we can all agree that nobody wants acne, right? That's not anything. There might be a few weirdos out there, but I think the vast majority of the human race don't want acne. Uh, and that's why, but what people, people get, it's a very common condition, and that's why you need Proactive. Proactive combines gentle skin care paired with the best acne treatment for your skin. Um, Proactive has three different systems designed for your skin type, and because not everyone's skin is the same. And with Proactive, it's, it's whatever, you, whatever your personal needs are, they're able to meet it. No matter your type of breakout, breakout, Proactive combines gentle skin care paired with the best acne treatment for you. Um, they've got three systems. Okay, they've got the Proactive MD Advanced, which is prescription strength for really stubborn breakouts. They've got Proactive Plus Gentle, which is for more gentle, uh, sensitive skin types. And then Proactive Solution Original, which is the original system. And this is for, for all types. So whatever you need, if you need the more heavy duty stuff, you've got that. If you need something, if you've got more sensitive skin, you've got that too. Um, they've got clinic, clinically proven ingredients, which are tested by dermatologists. We know this stuff works. And it's really as simple as that, Proactive works. Right now is a, a great time to try Proactive. For my podcast listeners, you can get a special offer available by going to proactive.com slash Walsh. Proactive subscribers will receive the Hydrating Duo as a free gift. That includes four um, hydrogel masks and the green tea moisturizer. You get all of that as a gift and it's a good thing to have for the holidays. You also get free shipping on top of that. Again, visit proactive.com slash Walsh to take advantage of this special offer now. That's proactive.com slash Walsh and subscribe to Clear Skin. Report here from CBS. It says lawmakers are running out of time to pass another coronavirus relief package before Congress adjourns for the holidays. Uh, a major point of contention is whether any package will include a second round of stimulus checks, the direct cash payments that help millions of households weather the economic crunch caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Of course, to clarify, this is not an economic crunch caused by the pandemic. It's an economic crunch caused by the disastrous lockdowns where we're telling people they can't go to work. Um, a, uh, a $908 billion bipartisan proposal initially left out stimulus payments, um, but a last minute addition to the package could include another round of checks, most likely at the $600 per person level. Um, and so that's, that's what we're looking at right now. It's not, it's not, it hasn't gone all the way through yet, but we're looking at $600 a person and not for everybody. You know, lots of people aren't going to get anything. But this to me is, is just perfect. This is, this is a, a, a perfect encapsulation of, uh, of what we get from the government and from lawmakers in that it's the worst of all worlds. It's pretty much the worst possible thing you could do to give everybody $600 or give millions of people $600 because you're still spending all that money. Okay, we're still spending billions and billions, almost a trillion dollars on top of the trillions we've already spent. So we're still spending that. We got that part of it. But you're not giving nearly enough to make any difference to anyone. You know, either someone's in a position where they're doing okay and they and you know, they might not be thriving, maybe they are thriving, but they're doing okay, they're making it by. And for them, sure, $600 is nice, but they don't really need it because they're already they're, they're they're not in the middle of an economic crisis. Um or someone is in a financial crisis and, you know, is in, is in dire straits. And for them, $600 is going to do almost nothing. It'll pay a couple of bills, but it's, that's it. I mean, is there anyone in America who right now is in a situation where they're, they're in a crisis, but all they need is yeah, maybe someone who, who, who borrowed some money from the mob or has gambling debts and needs 600 bucks. But I think the people who are in a crisis because of these lockdowns need a lot more than 600. So you get people who, who don't need anything, who are given, we're, we're going to be paying billions of dollars to give money to, to, to a lot of people who don't need anything. And also billions to give uh, not enough money to people who need a lot more. So there's, there's no point. Either give nothing to anybody, or you need to give a lot more than this. 
Um, all right, let's go number two. ABC News has this. We'll play the video for you. Uh, it says, cheers erupted in the streets of Buenos Aires, Argentina, after the country's lower house voted to pass a bill legalizing abortion, uh, a measure that will next go through the Senate. So you can see here the, the crowds celebrating uh, celebrating the, the, the passage of this, this bill. Oh, it just... It, you see that they're jumping, mostly women, younger women in the crowd. They're jumping, they're hugging, they're waving flags. They're in tears. They're crying tears of joy. And what are they... Now, you see something like this and you think, if you had no context, what would you think is going on here? Maybe, maybe there's, you know, you can see this maybe if they're watching... Their team won the Super Bowl, something like that. But no, this is this is they're, they're excited. This is what they're excited about. They're excited that they'll have the opportunity now to kill their babies. They're in tears of joy because now, if they need to, if they want to, they can kill their children. That's what they're weeping tears of joy over. Not you know, no great shock here. We know that this is the case with the pro-abortion movement. Except that what what are we always told? We're always told that the pro-abortion movement is not the pro-abortion movement. They're not. Oh, nobody's, nobody's pro-abortion. Nobody likes abortion. This is the line we get from pro-abortion people all the time. No, no one likes abortion. No one, no one likes it. No one's, pro- oh, we're pro-choice, not pro-abortion. Really? That's what you just saw there. Those aren't people who, who like abortion. They are in tears of joy hugging in the street because they can now kill their children. They obviously want to be able to do that. They are very pro-that. Now, the pro-abortion movement is is starting to move a little bit away from that line of saying, you still hear it a lot, but they're starting, there's a movement now uh, very clearly to move away from that and to stop saying, oh, no one's pro-abortion, and instead to say, sure. But this is still among, mostly among the radicals on the pro-abortion side who will come out and, you know, shout your abortion. They say, yeah, you know, I, I like abortion. I'm in favor of abortion. It's not yet in the mainstream of the pro-abortion movement, but I think it will go there. And really, it's their only it's 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 a it's their only strategy. Because the problem all along, it's like when they used to say, you never hear this anymore. But I can remember even growing up in the '90s, um, the big the the line, the, the the slogan, the thing they put on the poster boards and the bumper stickers was um, "safe, legal, and rare." And now they yeah they still want abortion to be legal, of course. And they still talk about the mythical safe abortion, which, of course, no abortion can be safe because there's always at least one person being killed in it. Um, And often more than one person being, well, in fact, in every case, more than one person being harmed physically and emotionally in in every other sense. But um, so but they still they, they still pretend. So they still say, yeah, safe, legal. They don't talk about rare anymore. And the problem is when you say, oh, we want abortion to be rare or when you say, oh, uh, nobody really likes abortion. The follow-up question is why? Well, you say nobody likes it. Why don't they like it? You say you want it to be rare. Why do you want it to be rare? And the answer is because it's a it's a it's a horrifying, horrible, abominable thing. But if you admit that about abortion, then the whole house of cards comes tumbling down, and so their only choice is to uh, is to pretend that it's it's uh, that in fact it's a positive. It's a it's something to celebrate. All right, we played for you yesterday the clip of Tom Cruise berating the staff on the set of the new Mission Impossible film. And now a number of celebrities have come out to defend Cruise, including George Clooney, who says that he, he understands why Cruise did what he did. Um, the guy who played Olaf, what was his name? He, 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 uh, he defended him, Whoopi Goldberg. A bunch of celebrities have come out and said that you know they've taken his side. This is weird for me because... I have no affinity for any of these people, Tom Cruise included. And I disagree with why they're saying what they're saying. The people defend the, the celebrities defending Tom Cruise. They're defending him on the basis that, you know, everybody should be wearing masks. In fact, in fact, George Clooney said it in, in this answer. I think he was on with Howard Stern. And he also said, oh, just wear the damn mask. And, you know, that's his point. That, yeah, it's good. It's good that Tom Cruise is, is, uh, is yelling at people for not wearing masks sort of in general. I disagree with that, but I also have no problem, as I said yesterday, I have no problem with what 
Tom Cruise didn't. I read, you know, it says also that five staffers quit, have already quit because of this rant from Cruise. And I'm more on Cruise's side than the staffers. Only because if you, if you go back and you listen to what Tom Cruise was saying, he wasn't saying, oh, put the mask on because you're going to kill me if you don't. You know, you're, 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 you're endangering my safety if you, don't, if you don't wear the mask or if you don't follow the protocols. That wasn't his point at all. His point was, this is what we have to do in order to keep this industry running, in order for people to have jobs, and you guys need to play this game because this, people depend on this. And, this, and they're going to lose their homes and they're not going to be able to feed their kids if this movie gets shut down because you guys can't follow the protocols that we're all following. That I completely sympathize with. Which is also why, you know, I've, the, the masking thing, I hate. But I understand why businesses do it because they have to do it in order to open, in order to stay open. At least many of them. It kind of depends on where they are, what state they're in, what the local ordinances are, how strict it is. But, um, yeah, I I have a lot of respect for the businesses that have taken a stand and said, no, we're not going to go along with it. But I also understand if you're a business owner and you say, look, you know, I got to stay open. I've got employees I got to take care of. I can't afford to get a $5,000 fine every day. That's going to shut us down and we're all going to be homeless. And I got a responsibility to my employees, so I got to do this. I don't want to, but I have to. I understand that too. I'm sympathetic with that. And that's why I say all, all of our anger should be directed at, at the, the government, at the, the tyrants who are imposing this stuff, not really at the business owners who are just doing what they have to do to navigate this and survive. Um, all right. An, an ESPN commentator and former NFL player has made an admission that he probably should have kept to himself. Uh, about why he doesn't like the Buffalo Bills. Now, plenty of good reasons not to to like the Buffalo Bills, but um, here's the reason he came up with in an interview on a a podcast. This is, um, is, I believe, Dominique Foxworth, and here's what he said. I would be 100% lying if I said that when Josh does something dumb, a little part of me doesn't get happy. And it's not because (laughs) I want Josh to succeed. It's because the people who are telling me that Josh is the second coming and Josh is better than everybody are people with American flags and dogs and skull and crossbones in the <laughs> Abbeys. And then if you go just take a dip into their tweet history, it's some really concerning yeah. retweets and likes. Yeah. Um, so that's Josh Allen, the quarterback of the, the Buffalo Bills is referring to there. Now, j- just to be clear about what he, what he's actually saying here. Uh, and it's, it's not, it's, not very subtle. What he's basically saying is a lot of white people like the buff, the, bu- the Buffalo Bills, and that's why I root against them. That's what he's referring. And well, more specifically, white like conservative people, people people with American flags, um, in for their profile pictures, uh, like the Buffalo Bills. So that's why I root against them. It's just just some more more open bigotry. Just put out there, no problem. He's gotten a little bit of pushback about this, but but not much. Um, and he, and he's, he's fine. He'll, he'll keep his job on ESPN and, because this is the way it goes. This is a totally acceptable bigotry in the United States today. Uh, okay, number five. This is from NPR. This is, this is the, the, the headline from NPR. They said, Pete Buttigieg, president-elect Biden's pick for transportation secretary, said that he has a personal love of transportation, recounting train trips on Amtrak while in college, and said he proposed to his now husband, uh, Chasen, in an airport terminal. So th- this is explaining, because remember, Pete Buttigieg was appointed the Secretary of Transportation. He is, uh, as we talked about yesterday, big news here, big deal. He is the um, second gay cabinet official in history. He's the second. Huge, huge stuff. And probably the first one in the Transportation Department. But now they're explaining... You know, why he deserves to be the head of the transportation department. And the reasons he deserved it is because he loves transportation. He he rode on the Amtrak as a kid and he proposed to his husband in an airport terminal. Now, the Washington Post has come out in defense. Washington Post, democracy dies in darkness. And their whole, you know, we, we can we can rely on them to hold the powers that be accountable. And so their headline today was Pete Buttigieg is right. 
Airports are romantic. This, by the way, not an op-ed. This is not in their opinion section. I think this was like in their lifestyle section. Airports are romantic. Uh, Now, many people are focusing on on this idea that um, he's qualified to be the Secretary of Transportation because he proposed in an airport terminal and, and, uh, and, you know, he rode a train in college. People are focusing on that as the dumbest thing. And that is very dumb. You know, that is like me going to uh, apply to become the head chef at a four-star restaurant. And, you know, I hand in my resume and I've got listed qualification. Um, I enjoy eating. I had a birthday party at the macaroni grill when I was in fifth grade. You know, it's like that. Um, And that is very dumb. And I, I think that that deserves quite a bit of mockery. But let's not let, let's let's please not just skip over personal love of transportation. What does that mean? You love transportation? Oh, you know, I love transportation. Oh, what do you mean? Like you like to travel? No, just transportation in general. I love it all. Like cars, bus, scooter, rollerblades. I'm just a big fan. Big fan. Of, I'm a big fan of transporting uh, through really any means. This is good. I mean, it is good. though. I think in fairness, it's good to have someone who is pro-transportation heading the uh, transportation department. There are a lot of anti-transportation people out there. That's a big thing. You talk to people all the time and they say, no, I'm really, ag- I'm against, and I, you know, personally, I'm against transportation. I don't think anyone should go anywhere ever. So, um, so maybe that's good. Maybe that's all for the best. All right. We're going to get to our daily cancellation in just a second. I did want to address something real quick. Um, this is this is this is a. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, maybe you've you've followed this controversy a little bit. But before we move on to the next segment, I did want to address this because there are many people. Speaking of cancellations, there are many people attempting to cancel me this week for a tweet that I that I sent out, um, which I posted a couple days ago, and has provoked a very strong reaction that is still not still not gone away. Um, I'm being called a sexist and a, and, a, and a misogynist and a bad husband and a bad father for this. Here's what I said. I said, as a father of four kids, I can say one thing that never gets easier is changing dirty diapers. Very disgusting. I mean, I've never done it, but it seems like it probably sucks. And this has caused many people, many, you should see the emails I've gotten, to experience real anger and hurt. Uh, Because they say that this is, you know, it's misogynistic, it perpetuates a stereotype. And so what I want to do, I I don't often do this, but I wanted to apologize Um, for this, I do deserve to be canceled. And I just want to clarify that I didn't mean anything offensive by it. All I meant, all I meant is that changing diapers is women's work. That's all I was saying. Um, I didn't mean if I'm sorry if I was misinterpreted. I didn't mean anything besides that. That's all I was trying to say. And I do admit that I have avoided at all costs, the diaper changing task. I have devised many clever schemes in order to accomplish this. And the first one, which is really quite brilliant, is uh, whenever I I smell a a diaper, whenever I smell a a full diaper, I will say to the child, hey, you you need a new diaper? Go find mommy. Go find mommy. Go find her. Go find mommy. I bet she has candy for you. Go find her. And then they'll run off and they'll find mommy. and, And then the next part of the strategy is to go hide. So, you know, hide, lock yourself in a bathroom, hide in the garage, go run an errand. Don't come back to the coast is clear. You know, we develop. These are survival strategies we we develop as parents. But um, that's it. I just wanted to clarify that. And I'm I'm sure that now I have um, people will will feel better about it. And it's good that I was able to get that off my chest. It's been a tumultuous year, uh, a lot of uncertainty. And we know that's, you deal with that every year, especially this year. And one thing about, 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 about tumult and, and, and uh, uncertainty is that you, know, you want to start thinking about your investments and hedging your investments with something something stable, something like gold. Uh, and you hear a lot about gold and how the price of gold is skyrocketing. And that sounds great, but the problem is it's sort of a barrier to entry where you feel like, well, I can't go out and just buy gold. I don't have the money for that. That's why Acre is such a great company. Acre lets you subscribe to gold bars for as little as 30 bucks a month. You pay each month. And once your gold stash reaches the price of their gold bars, they discreetly ship Acre gold to your house. 
Um, so what this means is you can invest in physical gold without having the money to you know, come out of pocket all at once. You can build up to it. With Acre taking physical delivery of your gold means it's safe and sound and in your hands. Acre designs their gold in California, so sources their gold from one of the largest mints in Switzerland. Um, and on top of that, they've also got, if you feel like you want to be a little bit more aggressive, they've got uh, the recently introduced $100 per month subscription for their five gram gold bar. Whatever you want to do, you know, however you want to approach this, the fact is to get to start investing in gold, and maybe that's a, a New Year's resolution. I'm going to start investing, and you can start investing with Acre. Visit getacregold.com slash Walsh and start investing in physical gold today. Make sure you go to this URL because Acre is giving away a gold bar. If you want to qualify for the giveaway, tweet or post why you should be the recipient and mention at get underscore Acre. Again, that's getacregold.com slash Walsh, and we want to thank Acre Gold for supporting the show. And um, this is coming up in just a few days, Monday, December 21st. The historical docu-series Apollo 11, What We Saw, will be available exclusively at the Daily Wire uh, website, dailywire.com. Originally released as an audio podcast, and it was, it was very successful in audio form. If you, even if you, if you saw it in audio, if you listen in audio form, I would recommend watching it. It's even better watching it. If you never heard it at all, then you're really in for a treat. You can watch as well as listen on the Daily Wire, Apple TV, or Roku app, or at dailywire.com. Yes, of course, is a dramatically inspiring story. Apollo 11, what we saw. Fantastic series to watch with your loved ones over the holiday break. And right now you can get it for 20% off with code WATCH when you go to um, dailywire.com slash subscribe and become an insider or above member. And finally, one other thing on, uh, Monday, November, on Monday, December 21st, be sure to watch backstage at 7 p.m. Central Time to see all the Daily Wire hosts wrapping up the year. And uh, I will actually be there. Uh, because I have emerged from my cave and I am amid society again, which means I will, I will be there for the backstage and uh, it'll be good wrapping up what we may call a very unique year. So make sure you tune in on Monday for that. All right, we're going to move on now to our daily cancellation. Today, we're going to cancel everyone involved in this story. The singer Lizzo has been in the midst of a PR crisis and public backlash because She drank a smoothie. Lizzo announced on Instagram that she had decided to go on a juice cleanse. And this news provoked horror and outrage among many people in the, quote, fat community who felt that she had betrayed them. Uh, Lizzo is a smoothie drinking Judas, selling out her fellow fat people, stabbing them them in the back. Let's read some of the reaction from people who are extremely mentally stable, I'm sure. This is one person, blue checkmark on Twitter says, Lizzo, girl, why? It was inevitable. The industry is so violent towards fat women. Of course, she was going to submit to toxic diet culture. It was only a matter of time. I think the disappointment lies in a lot of us, especially fat black women, seeing ourselves in a woman who was so proud and confident in her body. It made us want to do, want to do the same to ours. I have empathy for those who succumb to the pressures of fat phobia, especially when you're in the public eye, especially when you exist within several intersections that carry little privilege. Other reactions, someone says, fat phobia intersects with other oppressions. If you're a feminist or an LGBTQ plus ally or stand with BLM, et cetera, you have to stand with fat folk too. Someone else said, to see Lizzo finally fall into the trap of detox scams is so disheartening. She was the beacon for fat girls like me. A goal that, sorry, I almost read that as bacon. Um, I did almost read it, but I didn't read it that way. Uh, A goal that showed A goal that showed we could learn to love ourselves and damn everyone else. And now she's not. I feel so hurt. And then there was this. Yes, I'm angry. Yes, I'm triggered. Yes, I am mourning a big B word uh, that she might want to get skinny because that's one more battle fat phobia has won. Another loss to a system that wants me dead. And then someone else accused Lizzo of promoting stuff that directly damages our community, that being the fat community. Now, this all led to Lizzo releasing a statement on TikTok explaining why she went on a diet. She wants to be very clear that she in no way was trying to lose weight. God forbid she would never try to avoid heart disease and extend her life and enjoy greater health and fitness by losing weight. Never. That would be terrible. So here's how, here's how she explained her suspicious smoothie consumption. Listen. I did the 10-day smoothie detox, and as you know, I would normally be so afraid and ashamed to post things like this online because I feel like as a big girl people just expect if you are doing something for health you're doing it for like a dramatic weight loss 
and that is not the case. Um, in reality, November stressed me the f out. I drank a lot. I ate a lot of spicy things and things that f my stomach up. And I wanted to reverse it and get back to where I was. I'm so proud of myself. I'm proud of my results. Um, my sleep has improved, my hydration, my inner peace, my mental stability, my fing body, my fing skin, the whites of my eyes. Like, I feel and look like a bad bitch. And I think, like, that's it. I'm a big girl who did a smoothie detox. And I wanted to share that with you guys. I got exactly what I wanted out of it. And every big girl should do whatever the f they want with their bodies. Sorry, I'm not buying it, Lizzo. I'm not. I think you drank a smoothie because you hate fat people. I know that's, what in, that's what's in my mind every time I go to Smoothie King. In fact, my favorite smoothie is called the Fat Phobia. It comes with bananas, strawberries, yogurt, whey protein, and a little dash of body shaming. Just a dash. I want to overdo it. So there are a number of very dumb things bubbling to the surface amid this controversy. The first and most obvious, of course, is the idea that fat is an identity that one should proudly embrace. Let's be clear about this. Obesity is a condition, not an identity. It is a self-imposed condition in most cases. Being proud of obesity is really no different from being proud of having liver cirrhosis, from drinking too much alcohol. These are lethal conditions brought upon by overconsumption. Some people may be more susceptible to liver diseases, and so their, alco their, their alcoholism causes major problems, whereas somebody else can drink just as much and have no problem. That's unfortunate if you're the person more susceptible, but it doesn't change the fact that it was avoidable. It was brought on by your own choices, and it's bad. It's unhealthy. It's deadly. It's not good. The same goes for morbid obesity. Yes, there are different body types. Yes, some people are heavier than others. But morbid obesity is not one neutral body type among others. It is something that happens from massive overeating, a catastrophic lack of physical exercise, and again, it will kill you eventually. So that's one dumb thing. Here's another. The fat community. This is one of the hallmarks of our modern age, the, the cheapening of the concept of community. Everything's a community now. Your physical characteristics put you in a community. Your, your sexual proclivities, vices, hobbies, everything. You know, we would say now that a fat man who enjoys Star Wars and video games and let's say foot fetishism is in the fat community, the Star Wars community, the gamer community, and the foot fetish community. But in what sense are any of these actual communities? The only thing you have in common is this one aspect of yourself, an aspect that is either unimportant in the grand scheme or unhealthy or just kind of weird. And yet this becomes a community? See, I know what's meant when I talk about the church community. If you have a church community, these are people who live near you, worship with you. Uh, they have in common the, the, with you the same, the same values and priorities at the deepest level. And you rely on each other for help, friendship, comfort, and support. It's a community. But what does it mean to have, for a fat person to have a community with other fat people? The only thing they have in common is that they don't burn enough calories relative to what they consume. How is this the foundation for any sort of meaningful communal relationship? And the other problem with this, commun this uh, communitization of everything, and yes, communitization is a word, according to me, and other members of the making up words community. The other problem with it is that it has the effect of, of making people comfortable with aspects of themselves that they should not be comfortable with. A person who struggles with a certain vice, say overeating, can go online, search Google, and find whole communities of people who are the same way and who aren't trying to get over it or overcome it, but are just living in it proudly. And then that person could say, oh, well, a lot of other people have this problem too. It must not be a problem then. Finally, we have to focus on Lizzo herself for a moment. The fact is, you know, she did go on a juice cleanse, and that is something you do if you want to lose weight. Now she's backtracking in what might be the weirdest backtrack in the history of backtracking. But it's clear that she was trying to get a hold of her weight a little bit, which is good. But you find this with a lot of celebrities, and, and, and some, of, uh, some of those people complaining on Twitter were right about just this one part of it. Where, where so often there are fat celebrities who go on about embracing your body just as it is, even if you're fat, and... Then they go and slim down and lose the weight. This isn't a betrayal, obviously, but it is a weird sort of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy in that it reveals that they didn't really mean everything they said about embracing your body no matter its size and staying positive about it, even if you're morbidly obese. They didn't believe it and shouldn't have believed it because it's crazy. Except that now, rather than say to their audience, 
hey, listen, actually being extremely overweight isn't good. It's not healthy. You know, um, I was able to get in healthier shape and let me help you do the same. Instead of that, they say, oh, no, being extremely obese is still super great. I'm not fat anymore, but you should totally stay fat yourself. They encourage people to be unhealthy, even though they clearly know better. So the whole thing is crazy, irrational, and highly cancelable. And that's why everybody involved here is canceled. Lizzo, the fat community, all canceled. And that'll do it for us today. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Production manager, Pavel Vodowski. The show is edited by Danny D'Amico. Our audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair makeup is done by Nika Geneva. And production assistant, McKenna Waters. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. The experts tell us we can't travel or take off the masks even after we get the vaccine. British scientists demand we postpone Christmas, and AOC defends porn. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.